Aloha. Welcome to Hawaii Electric Light Company's technical conference to address the 2012 request for proposals for renewable geothermal dispatchable energy and firm capacity resources on the island of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Kathleen Kelly and I will be facilitating this webinar. During this webinar, instead of using the full name of Hawaii Electric Light Company, many of us will be using HELCO. So we just wanted to make sure you understand that that's what that term is used for. I'd like to go over a few ground rules for the session and an overview of what we will be discussing today. Uh, the as I indicated, I will be the facilitator and will coordinate what is being done during the seminar. There will be a HELCO geothermal team presentation describing the RFP. We will have selected clarifications at the end of the technical conference. There will be no breaks that we anticipate at this time. Registered attendees may submit questions in writing. At the bottom right-hand corner, the bottom half of the screen to the right, there is a means by which you can input a question and hit send right below that box. If you use that box, we will be able to see the questions. We appreciate that. If you do submit questions and they are relative to a particular slide, please try to note the slide number for us as it will make it easier for us to be able to respond to your questions. Um, Written comments are required by anyone who wants to submit them by December 19th, and those will be submitted to three separate groups, and we'll give you the information on that a little later in the seminar. Some of the WebEx logistics that we have going here today, all participants are on mute. And in the upper left corner of each slide that in which we reference materials from the RFP, you will find that there are the section of the RFP is included in the upper left corner of each slide. So that should make it easier for you to reference where we're speaking about and if you need to page through the RFP during the session. Some additional ground rules. This presentation is for general information purposes only. In the event of any conflicts between what we say at this presentation and the geothermal RFP, the geothermal RFP shall control. Although HELCO may verbally answer questions at the conclusion of this webinar, bidders should only consider the written responses from HELCO as official information on the RFP. It's now my pleasure to introduce the project manager of HELCO's geothermal RFP project to you. Mary Ellen Nodike Grace is the project manager, and she will now introduce some key players. Good morning. It is my pleasure to introduce special guests at our technical conference webinar this morning. We have from the State of Hawaii Public Utilities Commission, Chair Hermina Morita, Chair of the Public Utilities Commission. In addition, in attendance, we have Mike Champley, Commissioner at the Public Utilities Commission, Catherine Awakuni, Chief Legal Counsel at the Public Utilities Commission, and Jay Griffin, Chief of Policy and Research at the Public Utilities Commission. In addition, I'm pleased to announce that we have an independent observer, Boston Pacific Company. In attendance today, we have Miguel Campo and Sam Choi from Boston Pacific. Today, we have Jay Ignacio, President of Hawaii Electric Light Company, who will soon give us some remarks, and also Scott Siu, Vice President, Energy Resources, Hawaiian Electric Company. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Chair Morita, who will provide us with some opening remarks. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Good morning. On behalf of the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission and Commissioners Michael Champley and Lorraine Akiba, I would like to welcome all the participants and thank you for your interest in this very important endeavor. As you all know, the Commission opened docket number 2012-0092 on May 1st to commence the com competitive bidding process for approximately 50 megawatts of firm and dispatchable geothermal power 
to come online between 2018 and 2023 or earlier. While an overall state objective is to increase the amount of renewable energy to reduce the importation of fossil fuels to ensure energy security and self-sufficiency, to be a successful bid for Hawaii Island, which has exceeded its renewable portfolio standards targets, any new geothermal power development must meet the commitment of lowering the cost of electricity to serve Hawaii Island, protect the environment, and be respectful of our culture and the Hawaii Island community. I want to clarify that the primary role of the Commission is to ensure that the bidding process is done in accordance with the framework for competitive bidding adopted in docket number 03-0372 and, and I quote from the docket, is fair in its design and implementation so that the selection is based on the merits. Yesterday afternoon, um, the Commission issued, issued its decision and order formally selecting Boston Pacific as the independent observer. And as mentioned earlier, Mikkel Campo and Sam Choi are um, joining us on this webinar. The duties of the independent observer are to monitor the geothermal request for proposal process, review the documents, code of conduct, and procedures to ensure an efficient, fair, and transparent process, and guide and advise the Commission and proactively make recommendations for changes that need to be made and report to the Commission as required. I want to emphasize that the independent observer serves as a contractor solely to the Commission and not HILCO. Again, thank you for your interest and participation in this webinar. And on behalf of the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission, happy holidays. Thank you, Chair Morita. At this time, Jay Ignacio, President of Hawaii Electric Light Company, would like to make a few introductory remarks. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome all of the interested parties and prospective bidders to this morning's technical conference webinar. Uh, this is really a milestone event in our geothermal RFP process. Uh, in this process, we're seeking up to 50 megawatts of new geothermal generation that can provide the full complement of grid services that our conventional generating units provide today. We are seeking this new geothermal energy to provide lower costs to our customers. At the same time, obtaining dispatchable firm geothermal power will allow HELCO to maintain system reliability while integrating other renewable resources such as wind and solar. This RFP process started back in 2011 after we received responses from 20 interested parties to our request for information for geothermal power on the island of Hawaii. Uh, since then, we've had a group working internally hard on this RFP, uh, and on November 9th of this year, we filed the draft RFP. Uh, we'll be taking your comments until December 19th, 2012, and then we'll prepare the proposed final geothermal RFP, and the independent observer will file the comments at the PUC. After commission review per the framework, Helpful looks forward to issuing the final geothermal RFP and begins soliciting bids and selecting a final award group in the third quarter of 2013. And continuing on with the process, we intend to file one or more executed power purchase agreement contracts with selected bids in the first half of 2014. Um, I really thank all of you for your participation this morning, and we're looking forward to uh, moving with this process and obtaining the geothermal energy that we're seeking. And on behalf of Hawaii Electric Light Company, uh, happy holidays to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now proceed to our agenda slide. The geothermal RFP team is very excited to reach this important step in the geothermal RFP process holding this technical conference webinar for interested parties and prospective bidders. 
The agenda this morning includes covering the objectives of the meeting, introducing <coughs> the speakers and some of the core team, and reviewing the roles of the key parties in the RFP process and communications protocols. We will discuss the project schedule and target dates in detail before focusing closely on the draft geothermal request for proposals document which was filed, as mentioned, with the Commission on November 9, 2012. We will go over for you the highlights of the structure of the draft geothermal RFP and some key requirements and commercial terms. We will also provide an up-to-date review of the HELCO electric system and technical requirements before going over the contents of the bidder's response package and steps for submitting a bid to the geothermal RFP. Selected written questions received from webinar participants during this technical conference this morning will be addressed at the end of the session. However, answers to all questions and comments will be posted on the Geothermal RFP website at a later date. The key objectives of this technical conference webinar are to review the Geothermal RFP process under the Hawaii Competitive Bidding Framework and meet the requirements pursuant to the May 1, 2012 Commission order opening the docket. Also, to discuss the steps and project schedule and review in detail the structure of the draft geothermal RFP document and the appendices and content. And this is all to encourage informed and comprehensive bids to the geothermal RFP. In addition, we will highlight facets of the geothermal RFP to assist you, prospective bidders, in developing the bid to meet the requirements. With these descriptions, key aspects of the process should be clarified to support the bidder's success in the process. With HELCO seeking up to 50 megawatts of new dispatchable firm geothermal power on the island of Hawaii, by 2018 to 2023 or earlier, it is anticipated that after the geothermal RFP team's evaluation process, one or more bidders will be selected for the final award group and then proceed with negotiations with HELCO for a power purchase agreement for a 20-year term to be approved by the Commission. This technical conference webinar, as noted, provides one way to submit written qu questions regarding the draft geothermal RFP. Another way is to write in to the official project email at geothermalrfp at helcohi, which is H-E-L-C-O-H-I.com, or to the commission, or as stated in the geothermal RFP section 4.3, or to the independent observer, Boston Pacific, whose contact information will be presented this morning. This must be done by December 19, 2012. The official contact for this geothermal RFP is HELCO's energy contract manager, Kevin Quo, whose contact information is shown here. However, if I may take a moment, I wanted to just mention a few of the over 12 members from various cross-functional areas of HELCO and Hawaiian Electric Company who have worked hard this year on the geothermal RFP team. Some of those will be speaking this morning. Myself, Mary Ellen Nordyke Grace as project manager, Kevin Cole as the official HELCO um, contract manager, Brendan Bailey is the HELCO legal lead, Art Secchi, who is director, Renewable Technology Division, and he will be our HELCO renewables expert, Ross Sakuda, who is HECO director, Generation Planning Division, is the HELCO price evaluation lead, Ron Bushner is HECO director, Transmission Planning, and he is the HELCO transmission lead. Lisa Dangelmeyer, HELCO operations superintendent, HELCO technical lead. Kathy Kelly, Chrissy McSweeney, and Terry Turnock, a geothermal expert who are from our Shaw Consultants International team. At this time, I would like to turn it back to Kathy Kelly. Thank you. I would like to talk a little bit about the roles of key parties in this process. 
The State of Hawaii Public Utilities Commission is responsible for reviewing, modifying, and approving the RFP, as well as the executed PPAs, and as indicated by Chair Morita earlier, manages the independent observer. HELCO is responsible for ensuring that a fair RFP process is in place through consistent communications and a transparent evaluation process with the IO. The independent observer monitors the interactions and process implementation to ensure fairness. The commission approvals required in addition to review of the RFP would require the uh, commission to approve, disapprove, or approve subject to some conditions the PPAs. There are a number of examples here on the screen that you can read and see in the document as to how the commission can address those approvals. The independent observer has been engaged, Boston Pacific, as we've all heard here this morning. Copies of all comments submitted to the commission must also be provided to the IO, and as Mary Ellen indicated, that information is provided a little later in this discussion. And we've heard a lot about their role. They are monitoring and advising relative to all steps of the competitive bidding process to ensure it is fair and adheres both to Hawaii's framework for competitive bidding and the commission approved codes of conduct. The independent observer contact is Miguel Campo, and his address and email are provided here. And it will also be updated on the R geothermal RFP website a little later on today. This is a little more detail about the role of the independent observer, as described by Chair Morita, with some of the more detailed information provided. As I said earlier, it monitors the geothermal RFP steps, communications, and adherence to the code of conduct. It reviews and monitors the evaluation process and works with Helco throughout that evaluation process to ensure it is transparent. It also assesses whether the goals of the geothermal RFP were achieved. Relative to submission of comments and questions in the geothermal RFP, you heard earlier that they are due by December 19, 2012. All questions and responses will be shared with and reviewed by the independent observer Comments must be delivered to three different parties. First is the commission in its docket. Second is the HELCO at the email provided on the screen. And third is to the independent observer at the email also shown on the screen. HELCO will provide formal written responses. It will be posted on the geothermal RFP website by or before the date that HELCO will file the proposed final geothermal RFP with the commission. And the geothermal website is provided on the screen. We would recommend that all of the interested parties and potential bidders please go to that website frequently as there will be posted announcements and updates and it is a valuable tool and source for HELCO to be able to communicate with you during this, this process. It is the only official means of communication between HELCO and the bidders. I will now go over some key steps and schedule. However, first I will step back to provide a bit of context. As Jay Ignacio mentioned, last year in 2011, HELCO completed a request for information for geothermal power on the island of Hawaii and 20 respondents provided feedback under this process regarding how to go forward with the development of additional geothermal energy on the island of Hawaii based upon four offered options or an option provided by the respondents. Overwhelmingly, respondents indicated a preference for the traditional competitive bidding framework rather than collaborative geothermal resource exploration in advance and desired to move expeditiously with the bidding process. And in fact, that is what is happening. Helco issued a news release on January 6th of this year summarizing the decision to move forward. And soon thereafter, the Helco Geothermal RFP team was formed. Helco filed an application with the commission requesting to open a docket for competitive bidding for renewable geothermal, dispatchable energy, and firm capacity resources on March 
16, 2012. This slide provides an overview of the RFP schedule. The updated geothermal RFP schedule may be found at the geothermal RFP website as noted previously. After HELCO's March 16, 2012 request to open the docket, the Commission issued the order opening the docket on May 1, 2012. This schedule overview, which covers the time frame from May 2012 to March 2014, which is the targeted end of this process, is shown here, and it will be discussed in more detail in the next two slides. On this slide, you can see the comments on the draft geothermal RFP are due on December 19th, as mentioned. HELCO will then post answers to questions by or before filing the proposed final geothermal RFP with the Commission simultaneously with the independent observer's comments and recommendations to the Commission. The Commission will then review the filing. Thirty calendar days after the filing, unless otherwise directed by the Commission, HELCO may issue the final geothermal RFP by posting it to the geothermal RFP website. Importantly for those on this call, the due date for bidder notice of intent to bid is seven days after issuance of the final geothermal RFP. Thus, HELCO requests that interested parties and prospective bidders periodically check the website for updates and information. The due date for bids is indicated as 60 calendar days after issuance of the final geothermal RFP. HELCO targets completing the high-level evaluation and selection of final award group 120 calendar days after the due date for bids and completion of the interconnection requirement studies and negotiation of one or more power purchase agreements 200 days after selection of the final award group. Executed PPAs would be submitted to the Commission within 30 days after completion of these PPA negotiations with those in the final award group. As project manager, I'd like to mention that this is an ambitious project schedule following a busy year on this project. The Geothermal RFP team invites <clears throat> prospective bidders to become familiar with these dates as we go forward. Now I would like to move on to the heart of this discussion, which is providing some highlights of the draft geothermal request for proposal document. Many of you may be familiar already with the draft geothermal RFP, which may be found on the geothermal RFP website by separate links. I will briefly summarize the structure of the document and the chapters. There are five chapters. Chapter one provides a high-level overview of the geothermal RFP requirements the geothermal RFP process, and general background information which may be of interest to the bidder. Chapter 2 describes the technical resource needs and requirements for the proposed project. Chapter 3 describes the commercial considerations and requirements. Chapter 4 provides instructions to bidders for the preparation and submission of a bid to HELCO. And finally, Chapter 5 provides a description of the evaluation process and criteria that serve as the basis for bid assessment and selection. A glossary of terms is provided at the end of the draft geothermal RFP document, followed by relevant appendices that provide reference information for bidders. I would like to now touch upon those appendices to highlight several of them, but I do invite you to become familiar which, with each one, even though somewhat lengthy. In particular, Appendix B is the bidder's response package which guides the bidder um, in preparing the document to submit to HELCO. 
Secondly, Appendix C is a model geothermal power purchase agreement, which is very comprehensive. There you will find a lot of um, technical information and more details on milestones that will be discussed later this morning. Appendix D provides Tariff Rule 19, which is interconnection and transmission upgrades. This forms the basis for our evaluation process. Finally, um, I highlight Appendix H, which provides HELCO transmission infrastructure information. Okay, this next slide provides in one slide some key information for the geothermal RFP. We have certainly covered some of those before. The size is 50 megawatts. However, the maximum generating unit size is 25 megawatts. We have mentioned uh, the target commercial operation date of 2018 to 2023, but it can be earlier. The independent observer, Boston Pacific, Helco does not plan to bid in this uh, RFP. The bidders should provide energy and capacity components to their pricing. The contract term is 20 years. The location is the island of Hawaii. Helco will not be providing a site to developers. And the Helco option to purchase is included, and it will be discussed further in a few slides. Okay. At this time, um, I'm wanting to just give a preview of what you'll be hearing about the geothermal RFP. Um, first of all, the geothermal RFP team is very proud of the work product of our efforts over the past many months, um, and we do look forward to your comments on the draft geothermal RFP. Um, I just want to highlight on this slide a few of the key attributes, and some of these are unique for an RFP of this type. Um, as mentioned, Helco seeks one or more bidders to develop up to 50 megawatts of geothermal power on the island of Hawaii, but the first 25 megawatts of a bidder's proposal will have priority consideration, as will be explained momentarily by Kathy Kelly. There is no geographic limitation regarding citing a bidder's project, but the bidder will be responsible, of course, to put forward a clear bid package. And the transmission considerations will be an important factor um, to consider for the evaluation process. Helco is seeking dispatchable energy with zero net output capability and a desired ramp rate along with other performance standards that will be discussed by Lisa Dangelmeyer. The bid evaluation process for this RFP is somewhat simplified and follows Tariff Rule 19. We will have two evaluation teams that will separately review price and system impacts and non-price factors, and the team will work closely with the independent observer. Helco is seeking lower overall system-wide cost to Helco customers and would like to move expeditiously towards selecting the final award group. Terry Turnock, geothermal expert, will review the guaranteed milestones and reporting milestones for the development of the bidder's geothermal project. And finally, um, Kathy Kelly, Kelly will later discuss the HELCO buyout option. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Terry Turnock. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Data indicate that the island of Hawaii has the geothermal resources necessary for power project development. The 2005 Geothermax assessment of the geothermal energy reserves on the island determined that there are five geothermal resource areas that have development potential. These are highlighted in red on the map shown on the slide. The Geothermax report estimates total geothermal reserves on Hawaii of 488 megawatts at a 90% probability of occurrence and 1,396 megawatts at the mean expectation. Approximately 85% of the predicted resource capacity is located in the Kilauea Rift Zones on the southeast side of the island, which is the greatest distance from the Helco load centers and transmission assets. This issue will be further discussed later in the presentation. 
Note that the indicated amounts are estimates of recoverable heat energy at drillable depth without implying that the energy could be commercially exploited for electric power production. The Geothermex report is publicly available online. As mentioned in an earlier slide, HELCO anticipates commercial operation of the geothermal generation assets addressed by the RFP between the years of 2018 and 2023. Given that geothermal power project development is a prolonged and complicated process that can take between five and seven years from conception to commercial operation, the RFP and PPA include a series of scheduled milestones against which the project progress will be tracked during this period. The milestones are typical commercial, regulatory, and material events in the geothermal power project development cycle with defined reporting criteria and scheduled durations that start from commission approval of the PPA. The milestones fall into two categories, guaranteed milestones and reporting milestones. Failure to meet the committed dates of either type of milestone requires submittal of a plan to HELCO that details the basis for the delay, describes measures for achieving the milestone, and an indication of how the project will meet the commercial operation date deadline. The difference between guaranteed milestones and reporting milestones is that guaranteed milestones have commercial consequences for failure to meet the committed date that include payment of delay damages and possible termination of the power purchase agreement due to an event of default. Milestone events are presented as an attachment B in the PPA and summarized in section 3.2 of the RFP and on the following slides. This slide in the next highlights the content of the guaranteed and reporting milestones. The RFP includes this table with the reporting requirements for each milestone, and the PPA adds to that the timing in months from the approval date of the PPA. In general, the milestone descriptions are self-explanatory and more or less in chronological order. I would like to highlight the requirements provide to provide surplus power, surplus production and injection well capacity above the amount required for the full electrical output capability of the power plant, which is described in the top box in the table on slide 26. The intent of the milestone is to ensure that there's adequate geothermal resource available to power the plant to full capacity should there be an unexpected decline in well output in the early stages of commercial operation. This is essential to guarantee that the committed capacity of the project is available to HELCO as required to support system operations. And with that, I'd like to turn the discussion back over to Kathy Kelly to talk more about the RFP process. Thanks, sir. What I'd like to discuss now is the option A and option B bid that is described in the RFP. One BC allows the bidder to offer a primary bid, which would be an option A bid, and an alternative bid, which we call an option B bid. Submission of an option A bid is necessary to submit the option B bid. The option A bid must conform to all technical attributes described in Chapter 2, the Resource Needs and Requirements Chapter of the RFP, and provide absolutely no exceptions to the performance standards in Section 3.2C, which is delivery of power to the company of the model geothermal PPA provided in Appendix C. Option B bid, however, may take exceptions to the technical attributes by redlining that section 3.2C of the model geothermal PPA. And as described in Appendix B, must itemize in their bid the cost implications of those changes to the technical attributes. The project needs to have the same generation technology in the same site as an option A bid. And for bidders, option B bid is not mandatory. In order for HELCO to assess the value of the option B bid, it is very important that the itemization of the difference in the cost implications is provided to the company in your bid. Notwithstanding either option, there are no modifications allowed to Article 4, which is suspension of redu or reduction of deliveries, in Section 25.20, which is environmental credits and RPS of the model geothermal PPI. Relative to the capacity of bids, should a bidder decide to offer a facility that is greater than 25 megawatts in size, 
bids for projects over that size in aggregate must separate their costs into two separate components. First component includes the cost to design, construct, maintain, and operate the first 25 megawatts or less of the committed capacity. And then the second com component should identify the cost associated with anything greater than that 25 megawatt size. The information that's required for this is explained in section 3.3 of Appendix B, the bidder's response package. And as noted in the figure on this slide, there are the options to provide the option A bid, option B bid, an incremental A bid, and an incremental B bid. Relative to bid pricing, we ask that bidders submit a multi-part pricing formula that has a capacity and an energy charge. Indexing is allowed only on the energy component using the GDP IPD and may not exceed a 1.5% increase in any one year of the term of the agreement. And bidders are required to provide their supporting cost information and assumptions as requested in Appendix B bidder's response package, which is a very important document and bidders should make sure that they understand that package. Part and parcel of the bid price will be the interconnection facility costs. Bidders are responsible for two of the costs shown in the figure below. Seller owned, which is identified as X, and company owned, which is identified as Y. The uh, system upgrades costs, for example, the project-related HELCO transmission upgrade costs will be considered in the high-level evaluation that will be performed by HELCO. HELCO is responsible for those system upgrades costs, and HELCO is responsible for estimating them for use in the high-level evaluation, which you'll hear a little, little more about later. It is responsible for and must estimate the cost for company-owned interconnection facilities. HELCO may modify that later in the process prior to execution of the PPA, and bidders must, as a result, include a price adjustment in a dollar per kilowatt month per $100,000 of company-owned interconnection facilities costs so that HELCO can use that to adjust as needed in its price evaluation. Final point on this slide is each bidder in the final award group will pay for the bid project interconnection requirements study that will occur after selection to the final award group. And there are the project acquisition options. HELCO is also asking bidders to provide an option to them to acquire the facility on the 5th, 10th, 15th, and 20th anniversary of the commercial operations date. And the bidder must provide the terms associated with that proposal in their bid. With that, I will turn the presentation to Lisa, Dang Lisa Danglemeyer so that she can go through a review of health care system and some of the things. Thank you. So I'm going to start with an overview of the HELCO system today. Um, HELCO serves the island of Hawaii, and there are no interconnections to the other islands. There is a mix of utility-owned and independently-owned generation. The pie chart shown on this um, slide is a representation of the energy mix of the transmission connected generation resources with a very small amount of distributed generation. As you can see, the, um, there's a significant amount of renewable energy already on the system, which is the green part of the pie. We dispatch the dispatchable resources using automatic generation control. The fossil resources include steam, combined cycle, and diesel resources. The renewable energy consists of geothermal, wind, and run of river hydro. The variable resources, wind and run of river hydro, are treated as must-take energy on the system. The distributed generation capacity, which is not represented on this pie chart, um, is over 17 megawatts as of November 2012. 
this next slide shows a typical day, 24-hour period of dispatch on the HELCO system. The purpose of this slide is to show the daily generation and load patterns under typical variable wind conditions. The black line shows the demand on the system, which um, is in megawatts and the uh, on the y-axis on the left, you can see the values. And we are showing a 24-hour period. The staff chart begins on the bottom with the red value showing the minimum dispatch of the continuously operated generators, followed by, in the brown, a representation of the geothermal output. And then the green layer shows variable renewable energy production. As you can see, between the hours of 0 and 6 a.m., there is a period of time when the potential variable generation output exceeded the ability of the system to take the, demand, um, the energy. And during that period, the variable resources would be curtailed. The blue hash mark area shows the dispatchable region of energy. So where the blue hash mark is less than the black line, that would represent energy that could be purchased from a dispatchable resource on top of these minimum generation levels on the stack chart. Slide 38 shows a summary of the, as of December 2012, existing generation on the HELCO system. The resources on the left part of the slide are uh, fossil resources, and most of these resources, other than the steam units and the combined cycle units, are operated as peaking or emergency generation capacity. The renewable energy resources are shown on the right hand of the slide, and those resources, other than the geothermal resource, are variable resources. Slide 39 shows the history of the peak demand on the HELCO system, which typically occurs around sunset in the evening, and the minimum load for that year as well. As you can see from the slide, the system demand has been declining in recent years from its peak in 2007. The minimum load is generally half or less of the peak load. On slide 40, um, a load duration curve is shown, which shows the hours in a year where the load is at or, be at or below the value shown on the left-hand side axis. This graph shows basically the cumulative demand on the system over the year. And as can be seen by comparing from 2008 to 2011, again, we see that there has been a overall decline in demand. This has been driven um, in part by conservation, in part by economics, and in part by the growth of distributed generation. The current projections for growth in, are between 0.3% and 1.3% per year through 2045. Slide 41 shows over a 24-hour period some of the factors that are contributing to the demand decline. Um, this is again showing the demand over a 24-hour period and comparing the same day of the year, the Thursday before Good Friday, for the years 2008 through 2012. The peak is occurring around between 6 and 7 p.m. And you can see that there is a, de a decline in the peak, but a more significant decline has occurred during the day um, which we believe to be, um, well, we know to be in part due to the increase in solar PV generation on the distribution system. Slide 42 lists the generation which is considered must run and must take. And this, although this says 2011, this is still true today. Um, this is being assessed at this time to see if there are any potential changes in this dispatch for future operations. 
The um, must run generation is operated continuously except during periods of maintenance and consists of three steam units and two combined cycle units which are brought from dual train to single train during the minimum demand period. In the renewable energy category, the geothermal resource is 22 megawatts must take off peak and 30 megawatts on peak. The Run of River hydro and wind resources are all treated as must take and the system will accept their energy except under constraints when there are reasons why the system cannot take the energy. Excess energy on slide 43 is the primary reason why there are constraints against taking the variable energy from the wind and the Run of River hydro. Um, under those conditions, as was illustrated in that former SAC chart, um, we will curtail the energy. The majority of curtailments are for excess energy, which occur most days of the year and primarily during morning hours. The excess energy exists on the system when the minimum must run generation and with some room for regulating reserve response in the downward direction, plus the must take generation from the wind and the hydro resources is greater than the demand and losses on the power system. Under these conditions, the power production exceeds the island's ability to use the energy. Failure to manage excess energy would result in over-frequency as we are an island, and all imbalances will result in a frequency error. As mentioned before, the generation configuration for future operation is under evaluation. Um, but this excess energy consideration is one of the factors that is driving the request for a zero net export from the geothermal facility. Slide 44. Um, on this slide, similar to the stack chart shown, is similar to the stack chart shown earlier from an actual day. In this chart, we show a stack chart. Um, illustrating the potential energy with an anticipated dispatchable renewable energy resource added on the system. Under conditions of maximum variable generation output and with the must run fossil units dispatched at their minimum level, there would still be if load levels were the same as they are in this graph, which is a typical day in 2011. and represents pretty closely a typical demand in 2012, insufficient demand to take all of the available renewable energy from the dispatchable renewable energy resources except at peak. This is just to show that the amount of energy that HELCO can purchase is going to be variable and dependent on the production from the variable resources on the system. On slide 45, I'm going to start talking about some of the transmission constraint issues. At this time, there are significantly more constraints associated with adding generation in the east region of the island of Hawaii as compared to the west. Hypothet hypothetical geothermal facility scenario comparisons are included in Appendix H, Helco Transmission Infrastructure Information, as high-level guidance for bidders. The ultimate impact on the HELCO transmission system from a new geothermal facility is dependent on many variables, including geographic location, circuit configuration, transmission and distribution line capabilities, demand growth, and demand patterns. The HELCO transmission system has no interconnections to neighboring islands, so all power produced on the island must be used on the island. Helco's transmission system uses 69 kV transmission level, which will result in higher losses than a higher voltage transmission system would. Power generation at this time is primarily located on the east side of the island, while 60% of the demand, approximately, is on the west side of the island. Therefore, the east to west power flow is high. Adding to the east to west power flow reduces efficiencies further, has reliability impacts, and may require infrastructure additions. Alternatively, reducing the east to west power flow has system benefits. The east to west power flow is through three transmission corridors, a northern corridor which runs from Hilo 
up the Hamakua Coast through Maumea, the southern transmission corridor, which extends from Hilo to the south part of the island to South Kona, and a cross island transmission corridor, which consists of two lines through the center of the island between Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea. Now I'm going to talk about the technical capabilities we'd like to see from this geothermal facility. The, the summary of the to summarize our objectives, we are looking for technical capabilities that are similar to conventional plants. The facility will be a firm capacity resource with dispatchable energy. We will be dispatching the resource through automatic generation control. It will be participating in regulating and spinning reserves. There will be economic dispatch based on the incremental cost of the energy. The dispatch rate should be as large as possible. It should be designed for routine deep cycling to follow the daily load curve shown earlier. And we desire a zero export minimum due to the excess energy constraints that exist on the island. We would like the ramp rate to, dispatchable ramp rate to be as fast as possible. We desire a four megawatt per minute ramp rate. And this is to manage the variable energy resource on the island. Durations and Limits on dispatch need to be communicated to the system operator, and all outages would be coordinated with the HELCO system operator. To continue on slide 48, the primary, there needs to be a primary frequency response to support the reliability of the power system. Uh, we're specifying in the um, model P PPA uh, the H constant of 3.16 minimum a settable governor droop with a 4% nominal value, and the dynamic response rate of the governor is specified. Reactive power should be with for a defined power factor range, which will be dependent on the capacity and the interconnection point of the resource. And the resource will be expected to provide voltage regulation at the point of interconnection to a target specified by the system operator. Um, there's some... Um, because this facility will be an essential provider on the island system, on slide 49, I I'll list some of the unique considerations for such a facility on our system. Um, for one thing, we do wish that there should be no single points of failure. And um, we need to plan for this facility to be operable through faults and contingencies. Since we are an autonomous small power system, we routinely experience a wider range of system voltage and frequency than mainland interconnections would see. So as a result, we require continuous operation through a fairly wide range um, compared to mainland interconnections of 0.8 to 1.1 per unit voltage and continuous operation within 57 to 63 hertz. There are also disturbance rights through parameters described in the model PPA, which define a minimum expectation to remain operable through voltage and frequencies outside of the above ranges. And another consideration uh, to continue on slide 50 is that um, the facility needs to be designed for the natural phenomena that occur on the island, such as hurricanes and earthquakes. And we expect the facility to be manned and operated during storms and so forth to support the system during weather events. Total system failure or island-wide outage or separation from the system are more likely than would be the case on mainland interconnections and therefore we, are, we would find it desirable for self-start with minimal need for grid power. Um, participation in the facility being able to, to help with system restoration or black start would be desirable and it would be um, desirable for a sh short restart, sorry, short restart or cold startup. That's the end of, I guess, my portion. Thank you. Now we'll discuss a little bit the uh, good evaluation criteria and the high-level evaluation process that has been included in the geothermal RFP. As an overview of the evaluation process, there are eight primary steps. First, we'll check the bid is complete. Secondly, ensure that the eligibility requirements are met, followed by ensuring that threshold requirements are met. 
Then we will move into the actual evaluation phase, and that will be broken into two teams as described earlier, one to assess the price and system impacts, which will be weighted 60% in the evaluation, and a second team to evaluate the non-price criteria factors, which will be weighted 40% when they're merged. At the end of those separate evaluations, we'll merge the resulting analysis and select the final award group. Might note here and that this is a verbal description of the picture that's included in Exhibit 5-1 in the RFP. We will then move on after we select the final award group to a parallel process of completing the interconnection requirement studies for the final award group participants and moving through the contract negotiation stage. And when that is complete, the executed TPA will be submitted to the Commission for regulatory approval. As I said earlier, first assess it, the completeness of eligibility and threshold criteria. We have two teams, and then each independently does their analysis separate from one another, and then they emerge to establish the top bid. The eligibility requirements are described in Section 5.3 of the GFML RFP, but the bid, bid certification form and the bid fee must be received on time as described in the RFP. The capacity must be firm and dispatchable, as you just heard from Lisa. The bid must be capable of meeting the requirements of the GFML RFP without relying on completion or implementation of any other project. It must be fully independent and the bid must be organized according to the directions in Appendix B. Threshold requirements are provided here. And for the threshold site control, it must demonstrate control or right to acquire control. For the bidder project development experience, the team must demonstrate its experience in all phases of geothermal development. The bidders must demonstrate that the technology is commercially proven and readily available. The financial aspects of the accounting standards must be addressed by each bidder to ensure that it doesn't impact Telco's financial standing. And the bidders must agree to meet all requirements of credit and collateral requirements as described in the RFP. This picture as a is just provided as Exhibit 5-1 in the RFP. And what's key here is the middle boxes that once it has met the threshold requirements, we go into a parallel phase of evaluation to try to streamline the process and to evaluate and rank the bids so that we can collect the final award group as quickly as possible and move forward into the final stages of negotiation and the interconnection requirements study. This is Exhibit 5-2 from the RFP and is also important. The top section of it, which we recognize is difficult to read, provides the price system impact criteria and factors are described on the right. Likewise, the bottom five sections demonstrate the non-price criteria and the factors on the right that will be considered as part of that. What we'd like to do now is pass this to Rob Sakuda, who will describe the price system impact evaluation process and considerations. Thank you, Kathy. Before the bids are submitted, we will provide all of the key modeling inputs that will be used in a pricing evaluation to the independent observer, and all of those key inputs will be locked down. So this slide summarizes some of those key inputs. For example, we will lay down a reference long-term resource plan that will establish the resources that the utility would install if not for these geothermal resources. It will provide a long-term plan for generating resources as, as well as uh, transmission lines. Part of, the key evaluate, part of the evaluation will rely on a forecast of sales and peaks peak demand, forecast of fuel prices for the utility fuels, key data on the generating units like their ratings, efficiency curves, 
fixed and variable costs and maintenance schedules. And we'll also be using financial information like revenue requirement factors and a discount rate. For us to conduct a fair evaluation of all bids, all bidders must provide the information listed here on this slide. These are just examples of the key inputs that we'll need to conduct the evaluation. So for example, on, for resource information, we'll need to know the location, technology, minimum, minimum and maximum ratings, ramp rate capability, planned outage durations, expected forced outage rates, and emissions. And for our pricing evaluation, it needs to conform with the uh, term of the PPA and we'll need to know the capacity and energy pricing formulas and the escalation terms. All bidders will be required to provide all of the information requested in Appendix B, which is the response package. So this slide just describes the overall bid evaluation process and what I'm covering is just the section, the pricing evaluation, which is in the red box. So as part of the detailed pricing evaluation, we'll be using a computer model called Strategist. Strategist will be able to model how the system operates over a long period of time. Our evaluation will be a life cycle cost evaluation that would include uh, or account for interconnection facilities costs and end effects. The life cycle cost will cover a period of a about 35 years so that we can capture the 20 year term of the PPA. The evaluation will consider system impacts such as increased system costs which may occur if uh, the utility's heat rates are degraded. System benefits, for example, if system losses are, are reduced and also consider system upgrade costs, particularly on the transmission side. And our base, in our baseline costs, we will uh, calculate the net present value of the reference resource plan. And that would include the capital costs, operations and maintenance costs, and the fuel costs. In our evaluation, we will insert the proposed projects one by one into the reference resource plan and recalculate costs, assuming that the proposed projects will serve the island's capacity needs and thereby defer the utilities planned firm capacity additions and will also account for the, the value of displaced energy or displaced oil. I'm gonna turn it over to Ron Bushner for a overview of the Telco transmission considerations. Thank you, Ross. Lisa noted in her previous slide 45, <clears throat> there are significantly more constraints associated with adding generation in the east region of the island of Hawaii as compared to the west region. This slide presently displayed shows a simplified diagram of the HELCO system and highlights the cross-island transmission corridor and prospective geothermal generation resources on the west and east side of the island. Presently, most power generation is located on the east side of the island to serve the load, which is mainly on the west side of the island. This situation results in transmission lines in the middle cross island transmission corridor at maximum capacity under certain contingencies. Any additional east side generation will necessitate transmission system upgrades in this middle cross island corridor. If west side generation is added, the transmission system upgrades are not as costly as adding east side generation. Transmission system upgrade costs do impact HELCO rates and will be included in the pricing evaluation for prospective bidders. More details on transmission infrastructure information are included in Appendix H. And I'd like to uh, return it back to Ross. 
as part of our evaluation, our pricing evaluation, because we expect uh, or may receive bids of different sizes, different megawatt sizes, we will calculate a unitized cost in dollars per kilowatt hour so that we'll be able to compare among the different bids. In our evaluation, we plan to compare total resource costs of the long-term resource plans. So starting with our reference long-term plan, we will calculate the net present value of the capital, operations and maintenance, and fuel costs. And in, in our evaluation of each bid, we will insert the proposed project into the resource plan, thereby resulting in deferral of utility capacity and displacement of fossil fuel, and calculate the net present value of that alternative plan. And a comparison of those two net present values will give us an indication of whether the pro proposed project will increase or decrease rates and customer bills. When the utility signs our purchase agreements, it will, in the eyes of the accountants, incur fixed obligations. And therefore, in our evaluation, we need to account for what's, in, what, what's called imputed debt. We will also, as part of the evaluation, perform sensitivity analyses based on higher or lower sales forecasts and higher fuel prices. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Kathy Kelly for the non-price evaluation section. Thanks, Ross. Going back to our Exhibit 5-2, where we depicted the two pieces of the high-level evaluation process, I'll focus on the non-price criteria and we'll also describe in this section some of the factors that we'll be considering in that. This may not be an, an inclusive list. There may be additional factors considered as we go through this based on the information provided by our uh, bidders, and you should keep that in mind as we go through the process. But it will be monitored by the I.O., and it will be transparent to the I.O. what is being done as we go through this process. So for the non-price evaluation, there are five non-price criteria depicted in this slide. For purposes of review for HELCO, it is important to remind the bidders that more explanation relative to each factor is considered better to ensure that the evaluators on, on the HELCO team understand the implications of the bid and understand the process that the, the bidder and developer is going through on this. We'll go through each of these a little bit in the following slide. As mentioned by Chair Morita in her introductory remarks, we're very interested in lowering the overall cost customers, and that is an important issue for HELCO and its customers. So it impacts both the price and the non-price evaluation in this RFP. We are going to assess the potential for rate changes for customers resulting from each project, and that will be part of the consideration from a non-price factor. Second criteria is project development feasibility, and that we are trying to assess the likelihood of a project coming to fruition. So we would like to provide the status of activities and a plan for each factor by each bidder. For example, the critical cost schedule, we are trying to demonstrate the bidder's ability to achieve commercial operation state. We will also consider the price milestone that they propose in the model geothermal PPA here in this particular factor. Another important factor is the status of the bidder's plans for collaborating with the neighbors of the facility and cultural practitioners, for example, to obtain their input and to work with them to craft solutions to their needs relative to the project. This is very important to customers and as a result is also important to HELCO and should be very clearly demonstrated in the bid documents. I'm not going to go through each and every one of these. There's a clear description of these in the RFP. But I would look also at geothermal project development experience of the bidder and the project team. They need to be able to identify where there is another like size and like technology project that is operating that is similar to the bid being offered to HELCO. It needs to be a clear idea of a member of the team that has the relevant experience for development all the way through commercial operations. 
project operational viability is a criteria that means to evaluate the this viability of the project and reliability of the project for customers over the term of the PPA. In this, we look in particular at the locational considerations to identify infrastructure improvements that are required to transmission, improve roads, address improvements to water lines, the location on the HELCO system and the implications of that for system operation. We also look at visual impacts and mitigation strategies for those visual impacts. From a resource characterization perspective, we would look at documentation supporting the assessment that the bidders are providing to help us. Make sure that there is an analysis of sustainability and a plan to ensure the sustainability of the resource over the term of the PPA. For the design and operating profile criteria, that is an attempt to evaluate the system impacts of the project. For example, with regard to the cultural and native resource plans and community outreach, we would like to see the bidder provide a plan for ongoing engagement and consideration of the community and impacts on the community. From the perspective of the design of the power plant, it would include equipment performance and other applications to demonstrate real applications of that technology. To help those system impacts, to continue to stress, we would look at the ability to meet the load requirements, such as load following, by the project. And from the health of system benefits perspective, we would look at resource diversity and security improvements in the flexibility of the resource. And finally, from the flexibility perspective, we are looking at enhancements to the value of the project to, he, to HELCO, and that would be looking at the extent of contract exceptions provided to the model geothermal PPA, and also the cost and conditions offered relative to project acquisition options. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Christine McSweeney, who will describe the bid package preparation and submittal. Thank you, Kathy. I'm going to talk first about the bid preparation. All bidders should rely on information in the geothermal RFP and on the RFP website that is written. Um, that includes the questions that have been submitted throughout this webinar. We have a number of questions that have been sent in in the Q&A window. Many of those will be answered verbally at the conclusion of this conference, but all official responses will be the ones that are posted in writing on the geothermal RFP website after the conference. Um, a couple of bullets on this slide to note, each bidder must submit an executed confidentiality agreement, which is discussed a bit later. All communication with HELCO must be with the official HELCO contract manager via the, the geothermal RFP email, which is shown on this slide and throughout this presentation. Um, another bullet that's ex explained later in this presentation is the idea that bidders are required to organize their bid in a way that is consistent with Appendix B, the bidder's response package. Bid opening, the bids will be opened after the due date at a time deemed appropriate by HELCO. Um, the bid opening, will, the I.O. will be welcome to attend that and will be under their purview. Um, there will be, I think Kathy mentioned earlier, but there will be no opportunity to refresh the facility bid price or the seller-owned interconnection facilities costs uh, through the ex execution of the PPA. So the Facility bid price and seller-owned interconnection facilities costs that are presented, that are submitted as part of the bid, will be firm until the execution of the PPA. Bidder confidentiality again is included um, in Appendix F to the RFP. Um, bidder must clear, clearly identify confidential information provided in the bid. HELCO discourages bidders from marking every entry as confidential information and help will make reasonable efforts to protect clearly marked confidential information. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about the bid organization. It should be organized in three key parts, which are shown in the top right corner of this slide, the first of which is the commercial information requirements. Um, you can see them on the screen, and you can see them in the table of contents of Appendix B. Some ones I wanted to make sure to highlight are that 
1.5 redline version of the model geothermal PPA, which is discussed next. And another key piece is the community outreach in 1.7. That is included here in the commercial information section. And it is key for HELCO to be able to understand how the bidder has undertaken efforts to understand and create solutions with the community or plans to do so. And that is important for HELCO to review, so bidders should be sure to describe that information here. One note on the model geothermal PPA. Um, bidders must provide a redline version of this, and a word version of the PPA will be provided to facilitate this redlining. Bidders are strongly discouraged from proposing fundamental changes to the risk allocation. Um, contract changes, the number and complexity of which will be considered in the non-price evaluation. So minimal contract changes will be looked upon as favorably in the non-price evaluation, whereas more substantial and complex changes will be marked with a lower score. Bids that do not include proposed revisions to the geothermal RFP will, have, will be deemed to have accepted the model geothermal RFP, I'm sorry, model geothermal PPA as it is contained in Appendix C. Moving on to the second part of the bid organization is the technical information requirements. Again, those sections are listed on the slide and also in Appendix B, the bidder's response package. Some to note is 2.5. Sustainable Energy Resource Plan. This is where HELCO will understand the bidder or developer's um, plan for the geothermal resource and the longevity of that resource for providing electric power. The final part of Appendix B and of the bidder's submission should include the pricing information. The bid components are explained in Section 3.1. And Section 3.3 pricing information includes some tables to facilitate uh, submission of bidder pricing and cost information in a way that is consistent across bids and will facilitate how goal being able to evaluate that information efficiently. Relative to bid submission, bids must be received by the HELCO Energy Contract Manager by 4 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time on the due date listed in the draft geothermal RFP. Bidders must submit their bids in two formats. One, the hard copy, eight of which must be submitted. And secondly, the digital copy, which should be submitted on a DVD or a CD. No fax submissions will be accepted and no email submissions will be accepted. Bidders are solely responsible for their own compliance and qualifications. Guidelines for those can be found in Section 1.16, Bid Compliance and Basis for Disqualification of the Draft Geothermal RFP. And we, make, we wanted to urge bidders to make sure to review this section carefully to ensure that they're in compliance. The bid fee must be submitted when the bid is submitted. A non-refundable bid fee of $100 per megawatt per bid with a minimum of $2,500 for each bid submitted. Bids must be submitted again with the bid by the same due date, 4 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time on the due date shown in the RFP. To clarify, a single bid fee covers the bidder's ability to provide an option A bid and at their option an option B bid, and also covers the incremental submissions for under 25 megawatts or between 25 megawatts and up to 50 megawatts, as shown in this table. Bids for a different project type, technology, or site would constitute a different bid and require an additional bid fee. I'm going to talk a little bit about the credit requirements for um, successful bids. Bidders selected to the final award group will be required within 10 days of notification to provide a bid security deposit. The equation is shown on this slide and in the geothermal RFP. If a bidder withdraws from the final award group, the deposit is forfeited. If a bidder um, progresses from the final award group, selection into contract negotiations, their bid security deposit will be converted into a development period security, which is shown on this next slide. Again, the equation is there and also in the geothermal RFP. Upon execution of the PPA, the bid security deposit will be converted to a development period security. 
Upon commercial operations, this money, again, is converted into an operating period security, and again, the equation is shown there. All of this information, again, is in Chapter 4 of the geothermal RFP. Modifications or cancellations of the geothermal RFP. We wanted to note some stipulations. Helco reserves the right to request additional information from bidders at any time in the process, and these communications will be um, completed under the purview of the I.O., and, and the I.O. will be consulted to ensure that the process for communicating and the, and the information exchanged aligns with the competitive bidding framework. Um, and just to note at the bottom there, all actions that will be subject to the provisions of the competitive bidding framework and the I.O.'s observation of those actions. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Kathy Kelly. Thanks, Chrissy. Next steps relative to the Helco Geothermal RFP. Prospective bidders and interested parties should send their comments on the draft geothermal RFP and their questions relative to that by Wednesday, December 19, 2012, to three different parties. Helco with the geothermal RFP email, geothermal RFP at helcohire.com, to the IO at ncampo at bostonpacific.com, and to the commission in docket number 2012-0092. Again, we'll remind you that the contract manager for HELCO is Kevin Quo, and we encourage you to periodically visit the website in order to remain uh, up to date on what's happening with the geothermal RFP. With that concludes the presentation portion of this webinar, and we have received a number of really good questions, and we have selected several that we are able to answer here today verbally, but again, I will remind those on this webinar that the official response will be the written response that is posted on the Geothermal RFP website. With that, I will read the question, and then we will provide the answer so that everyone understands what we're answering. First question is, will the presentation materials be available after the webinar? Yes, slides of today's webinar will be available at the Helco Geothermal RFP website as soon as possible. Second, when will answers to questions be posted to the Geothermal RFP website? The response is that answers will be posted no later than the time of Helco's filing of the final proposed Geothermal RFP. Again, please check the Geothermal RFP website frequently for updates so that you'll see when that is filed. A third question, will the contact information for the Helco Geothermal RFP team members be posted? The answer is the official Helco contact for the Geothermal RFP is Kevin Quo, Eco Contract Manager. Kevin's contact information is listed in the Geothermal RFP, and you can refer to that to get in contact. A fourth question, is only one notice of intent to bid allowed per company? The answer is a company may submit multiple notices of intent to bid. A separate notice of intent to bid should be submitted to each project for which a company intends to submit in response to the geothermal RFP. And the fifth question is how many bids will be in the final award group? The response is that there is no prescribed number of bids that will make the final award group. And with that, the remainder of the questions that we have received will require a little additional research and discussion. Those will be written responses to those questions as soon as possible, but definitely before the final geothermal RFP is filed with the Commission for approval. With that, HELCO appreciates your opportunity to attend today and the fact that you did attend this webinar. We would ask you as you exit the webinar, there is a post-event survey. If you could fill that out for us, that would provide us valuable information about the webinar and your participation. With that, the webinar will conclude. Mahalo. Have a good day.